Uh, hi everyone, welcome to my science journey. This time we are privileged to be hosting Dr. Richard Mbasu, who's an esteemed proteomics and automation scientist at the Novo Nordisk Research Center, uh, and this is the Oxford branch. And his research is dedicated to studying cardiometabolic diseases with a particular focus on diabetes and obesity. Before his current role, he served as a scientist at UCB Biopharma in SLO. I don't know <laughs> whether that's the right pronunciation. Slough. And as a, uh, Slough. Okay. Slough, UK. And as a postdoc researcher associate at the University of Manchester. Um, he also holds a PhD from the University of Leicester, where he completed his master's degree as well. His extensive background in proteomics and automation, coupled with his research experience in cardiometabolic diseases, positions him as a highly impactful and knowledgeable contributor to the scientific community. And thank you so much, uh, Richard, for you know agreeing to come and speak to us and share your experiences with us. I think a lot of us are very interested in, you know, uh, how the pharma world look li looks like and whether it's something that we'll be interested in exploring in the near future. So yeah, we are glad to hear your experiences. Thank you for honoring our invite. And, you know, just start by, uh, maybe let's, let's start it light, maybe with a fun fact. Uh, can you, you know, share a fun fact with us before we start <laughs> the session? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, a fun fact, fun fact. Uh, I don't know. I've been to almost what, 5 countries in the world so far. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is spanning different continents, right? Exactly. Yes. I travel as a hobby. So. Okay. Is yeah. this also part of the being in the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, yeah, you could argue it's part of the work-life balance. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, nothing work-related, but yeah, mm -hmm. with work, again, you can always choose okay. where you want to, uh, where you want to go for a conference. So obviously, okay. those ones also add into that. Okay, great, yeah. great. All right, so we'll get started uh, with, you know, a lot of us want to know, how did you end up at Novo Nordisk? How did you, you know, moved from academia and now working at one of the largest pharmaceutical industries in the world. Can you share your story with us about how you got there? Yeah, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, giving me the platform to come and share my story. Um, I always, I'm always, I always feel like I have to give back to the society so that at least people can learn or, you know, uh, they can, if people, someone is struggling, they can find a way to transition through that and it's always through stories of what people have gone through. So uh, I started uh, my undergrad in uh, 2006 at the University of Leeds. So most of my early childhood was uh, in uh, Kenya and then went to Uganda to do my all levels. And then after that, I transitioned to, to, uh, to the UK where I started my uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Leeds where I studied medical sciences. Um, after medical sciences, I really wanted to do, do medicine. But uh, for those ones in the UK, you can understand how expensive it is to do medicine, especially if you're a self-sponsored student. Mm -hmm. So I uh, decided to, because I really wanted to continue uh, studies with my studies, I decided to further my studies uh, by doing a master's and that was at the University of Leeds, of Leicester, sorry, where I did a master's in cancer studies and molecular medicine. So that's where my my burning desire to stay oh. in research actually started. Oh. Oh. Um, because with undergraduate, it was more of, you know, you, you're studying, you're studying medical sciences. So you're really, you're just touching on these different aspects of research uh, and the medical field. But then when, you, when you're doing a master's, you actually immerse yourself into that proper, you know, real life research. You know, yeah. you're dealing with patient samples. So you, that's why I started looking at, you know, when you're given a sample like a uh, sputum, for instance, uh, you do some research on the sputum and then you look at the results from that. Maybe if you're looking for biomarkers and you see, oh, this is what is used to diagnose disease X. 
you know, it gives you that reassurance, you know, satisfaction, if you like, of wanting to carry on with science. So that's when I, you know, I had that now burning desire now to start doing research. So I applied for PhD positions, uh, which was a bit difficult because uh, because of funding, of course. Uh, and uh, for me, I was, I was I was a home student, so international students, that is. Um, so I stayed for two years without getting a position. And in those two years, I just kept, you know, doing all these uh, uh, microbiology work, you know, trying to find opportunities in different labs so that I can continue, you know, with uh, work experience, at least in the scientific field. And then uh, two years later, then I started my PhD in 2013 at the University of Leicester. So that was still with the same group that I did my master's with. And that was most was based uh, at the Glenfield Hospital. So my research was majorly in uh, cardiovascular sciences. Uh, to be specific, I was working with, uh, I was working on uh, finding the difference, distinguishing between uh, 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 diastolic heart failure and systolic heart failure patients. And then after that, uh, I immediately started my postdoc at the University of Manchester, um, which was okay at the beginning because, uh, I mean, it was difficult. I wanted to go straight to industry, but then the reason I went to the to start my postdoc was because it was an easy way to get into uh, the employment area because universities are equipped with a group that can you know, get you a work permit easily as opposed to industrial setup. And then uh, I did my one year, I did my postdoc, but then after some time, it wasn't the thing that I really wanted to do. So I transitioned now into industry. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, so I worked for uh, a few small industries and then I, I moved on oh. to work to, uh, to work at UCB. Mm -hmm. um, and then after UCB, I I joined Novo Nordisk. So okay. I've been to Novo Nordisk for about three and a half years now. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Did you always know that you wanted to transit into industry and, you know, were just waiting for the right opportunity to, to do that? Or is this something that, you know, be, you became aware of at the postdoc level? Um, I always knew uh, that I wanted to join industry yes mm -hmm. uh, because i remember when i was doing uh, when i was still a phd student i used to attend these conferences uh that uh connect you to the industrial world so there was one conference called p transitioning from phd to consulting mm -hmm. so that's the sort of field i was i was trying to venture into mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yeah so i wanted to really do consulting mm -hmm work so I wanted to transition from PhD to consulting but then again you know as as life yeah yeah so, you know yeah I found myself into back into research and I got the right opportunity all right so would you say that you know that the academic environment that you are in provided sort of like an opportunity for you to transit to industry or like a baseline sort of thing or yes. was it just something you're doing in the meantime no, no, 100%, 100%, yeah. because with the academia, like when you're doing a PhD, especially in particular, mm -hmm. you, you're you not really studying, you're training, you're learning, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a lot of ups and downs that you go through as a PhD student. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the things that, you know, add value to yourself. Yeah. How, how, how do you handle these things going forward? Yeah, yeah. When you've worked so hard in creating uh, addressing a certain problem in your yeah. in your in your in your field of research and then you get to the end and you've only got three months to yeah. finish how do you go about that mm -hmm. and you rarely hear like people just you know that they, they've never finished their their academic uh, their their, yeah. their doctorate yeah. you know yeah. so there is a way they maneuver through that by the mm -hmm. time you're actually given that certification yeah. that you are a doctor of philosophy, yeah. you've actually proved that you've overcome all these obstacles to get mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So all those difficulties actually mm -hmm. prepare you to mm -hmm. tackle the external yeah. world properly. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, can you point like maybe a few of them, maybe experiences or things you think that were transferable from ac the academia world into the industry roles? Um, so from from academia to industry roles, um, I can say uh, attention to details. Mm. Because in academia, you uh, most of the time you are just focusing on one particular project by yourself, yeah. whether you're doing a PhD or you're doing a postdoc, mm -hmm. it's very self-centered. Mm -hmm. So you tend to understand the knowledge of that particular area very, very well. Mm -hmm. So by the time you're coming to industry, then you're more conversant in that particular area compared to mm -hmm. other people who've just been doing things everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, all right. Can you maybe highlight, you know, maybe, you know, uh, a few key differences that you've seen in both the academia and the industry world, um, mm. and maybe like sort of like compare them? Yes, uh, uh, maybe I can start with the same point that I've just mentioned yeah. uh, of, you know, being self-centered. In mm -hmm. academia, you'll find yourself very lonely, like just focusing on the project. You're probably executing everything by yourself. If mm -hmm. you're a wet lab scientist, for those ones in the audience who are wet lab scientists, mm -hmm. uh, if your project requires maybe growing cells and looking at research in a particular cell model, you're probably mm -hmm. going to be the one doing the, you know, growing the cells, feeding the cells, you know, doing the automation of the cells, doing the data analysis of the cells. So you're pretty much everything there. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything. Mm -hmm. When it comes to industry, there is a lot of collaborative mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one thing that I've actually seen here, people who join uh, from University of Oxford uh, mm -hmm. po as postdocs and join uh, the pharma. You yeah. always see them a bit, you know, uh, struggling a bit to adapt to the industrial way of doing things because they're mm -hmm. used to doing things, everything by themselves. On their own, and then yeah. they come here and we're very collaborative. You find mm -hmm. one person doing uh, responsible for uh, the whole project, overlooking the whole project, but then mm. under that person, there mm. is a, a bunch of people under, and under under that person. Yeah. So one person is responsible for growing the cells. One person is, you know, you have the automation team on the side. You mm. have the team that is just specifically uh, there to take the data that's coming out of this research and then analyze this data. And then you get this other person who takes the overall, you know, collect all these other pieces, put together, package together, and then do the presentation. Yeah. So that's yeah. one of the big advantages that we yeah. have uh, in a pharm pharmaceutical setup. Okay. All yeah. right. And, and you know, I'm just going to, you know, take a step back and speak about something totally different. So aside money, what mm. other thing would you say is the rewarding aspect of you know being in industry and not academia um well the fact that you see the targets that you've generated uh from the bench mm -hmm. going to the bench side mm -hmm. so the targets that because here like for instance in novo nordisk mm -hmm. we do a lot of uh discovery work yeah so we do a lot of discovery work and then some of those targets that we've discovered in house yeah uh when you see these targets going into human you know you, yeah. what we call fast in human yeah uh it's quite satisfying because you can actually see where all the effort of the research has gone mm -hmm. in academia most of the time you will come up with these targets but then because of lack of financial muscle yeah yeah you yeah. end up just publishing and then you know you you can't really yeah. keep track of where these targets are going but here yeah, yeah, as okay. soon as you've generated these targets mm -hmm. they fly very quickly they are taken they start, there's a team that is very dedicated to uh trying to find a patent for that there's a team that is already doing the validation for that you know mm -hmm. because you know for us it's all about the money when we get yeah, a drug yeah. into the market then I mean, it's not just about the money. Money is one of the yeah, major yeah. rewards of a pharmaceutical industry to get yeah. the drugs to the to the hospitals. Yeah. And that's how the pharmaceutical companies grow. OK, great. Yeah. So and just speaking ab about that as well, you know, I've heard from a few people that, you know, when you're in industry, you tend to do the work that has been, you know, allocated or assigned to you. You sort of like cannot come up with your own, you know, 
sort of like research questions to answer, even though they are in, maybe in line with what the farmer is doing. Can you speak about that as well? Yes, I mean, that's true in a way, uh, mm -hmm. but it just depends on the industrial setup that you're in. Okay. So this is the thing with pharma. We mm -hmm. have uh, pharmaceutical companies that are called contract research organizations, or CROs. Yeah. That uh, that are used by these big farmers. These big farmers outsource some of the work that they cannot do in house to these mm -hmm. companies. Yeah. So what these companies do, they have to follow the recipe that has been given to them. Mm -hmm. to address the, the 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 research the question in in in, in the, the research question that mm -hmm. has been presented to them so with that one it's quite difficult for you to deviate or to apply your thinking into something because if you change anything then you're going to compromise the nature of the research mm. so you have to follow everything to the latter Okay. So that's that's another side of pharma. Then you get pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies like Novo Nordisk, like UCB, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pfizer, those ones. It's well, mostly they're called R and D, research and development. Yeah. So mm -hmm. here we 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 actually encourage to come up with ideas. You know, if you come yeah. up with a very good idea, then mm -hmm. uh, you do it. your initial experiment. You get a few. Uh, you get your initial data, and then you. You you present to the team, so it has okay. to be okay. feasible. Okay. Yeah. So mm. yes and no. Uh, yeah. I mean that 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 whatever you asked is correct. Yeah. But then it just depends with what setup pharmaceutical setup you're into. Yeah. Does this boil into whether you're in a large pharmaceutical like the one like Novo Nordisk or whether you're in like smaller uh, pharmaceutical companies? Like, do you have more control if you are in a smaller company than if you're in a larger company or vice versa? It's all about the resources at the oh, end of the day. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's all about the resources. If your company is big like Novo Nordisk, then yeah. uh, money could potentially not be an issue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because research is expensive as it is, as you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. It's very expensive. So if you have the financial muscle to yeah. carry out the research, then... Yeah. Yes, you will. Uh, you will. You will. You will be able to execute whatever you want, and you can throw as many ideas, and you have a bigger playground as compared to a smaller pharmaceutical company. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I'm gonna take a break there and just ask people that if you have questions for Dr. Richard, uh, please raise your hand, and I'll, I'll pick you to ask your question. Or you can also just type in the chat box and then I will read it out. So whichever you prefer, whether it's raising hand or typing. And while waiting for you guys to do that, I'm going to ask another question that, you know, is outside um, what I've been talking about industry and academia. And maybe just, you know, as someone that has, I don't know about the, can you speak about the work-life balance in pharma? Do you like get enough time to, to, you know, do your normal life other than just go and work in the industry. Industry, sorry. Uh, yeah, very much, very much. In fact, that one is very encouraged. Um, oh. There is a way they ask you if the work that you're doing is too much. Mm -hmm. So again, I think this is very pharma dependent. Based on the two big farmers that I've worked at, I think they care too much about your work-life balance. So if it's too much work, they'll ask you if you need any help, mm. for someone to come in and help. Okay. Yeah, but we encourage to take regular breaks, um, to take our holidays. You know, so at times they even force you to take holidays because it's mm -hmm. important for your work-life balance. They try mm. and not overwork people. Okay. Is it like a scenario of nine to five or do you get to do extra hours? Uh, again, that is dependent on... Uh, the pharmaceutical company you're working in. Uh, so previously I worked for another company called Envigo mm -hmm. um, and that was more than eight to four or nine to five. Mm -hmm. So at, at nine, everybody is, is supposed to be at work. At five, mm -hmm. you see a mass exodus of people, mm -hmm. you know, going on. Like in, uh, but here in Obonodisk, we are very, very flexible. So you, uh, you know, as you, you plan your own hours. So I can come in at 10 and leave with three. I can come in at, nine and live with six so it just depends on how much work you've got i see i see yeah. okay okay that's that's great 
Um, yeah, so guys, I'm still waiting for your questions. Just raise your hand uh, or type. Uh, but in the meantime, Richard, what advice would you give for someone that is in academia and is considering, you know, moving to pharma? Um, people in academia, it just depends with what you want to do at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. Do you want to, what route do you want to pursue? Do you want to go, uh, do you want to become a lecturer? Do you want to become a PI? You mm -hmm. know, do you want to become a professor? If those, if if your answer is yes, then it's best to just stick to academia and pursue okay. academia. But then, mm -hmm. if you want a fast-moving life, if you want mm -hmm. a very vari uh, variation in uh, projects, so you're not just hogging on one project the entire time, yeah. you're gonna be doing different things. Yeah. If you wanna move at speed, if you want to mm -hmm. actually see targets being the the targets that you've realized actually flying and getting into you know, the mm -hmm. clinical space, I think, mm -hmm. you know, pharmaceutical companies like Novo Nordisk, Pfizer, who have the financial muscle, the, those are the, the, that, that's your best shot. And obviously, um, mm -hmm. with industry, it's, it's, it's way rewarding than in academia in terms of yeah. Yeah. Uh, finances. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Richard, you know, a lot of times we speak about our achievements and, you know, things that we've been able to accomplish, but maybe could you highlight uh, a few challenges, either in the academia world or in the industry world, um, of, you know, one of the, one key, or not key, like one challenge that you're free <laughs> to share um, that you faced and how you sort of navigated through it? Uh... I think one of the things that I can mention is uh, uh, it can be very tough, uh, competitive area or mm. tough to progress uh, in an industrial setup. Mm -hmm. But then it's it, it boils down to your boss, your manager. Mm -hmm. So the way I navigated this area was to speak up. Yeah. And to be to try and improve on your visibility, because at times we tend to think we are working really hard in the mm. background mm. Um, and we are ticking all the boxes. We are generating targets. But then if you're not communicating effectively and you're not letting your manager know these things directly, mm -hmm. uh, then you, you, you tend you, you, you become irrelevant. Or basically, you're not really in the vision when it comes to when well, they're trying to progress people. So mm. that's one of the things that I had to change very, very quickly because I was doing everything mm. very well. And uh, every time when uh, the progression came, you see mm. other people flying and you're wondering, I've been doing A, B, and yeah. C, but I'm yeah. not getting there. Yeah. So what is it that I'm not doing mm. correctly? Mm. Yeah. Okay. It, so, and I think that this would be a struggle mostly for people that are, I would term introverted. Um, how how do you get out of that cocoon? <laughs> how do you get yourself out of that space and you know communicate or speak more to to your supervisor so that you know you feel heard? Sorry, say that again. I... So I'm saying like whatever you're saying about you know being able to accomplish or doing different things or even coming up with a target and you are sort mm -hmm. of like you feel you're not moving. It could mm. be a challenge, especially for people that are not, you know, out term uh, introverted, um, mm. because, you know, opening up and communicating could be, you know, like a problem. So how do you get yourself out of that cocoon, like, and, you know, come up to a place where you can easily communicate with your supervisors and, you know, share your emotions or your feelings about what's happening in the work environment? I guess. Uh, I mean, the way I navigated this is through mentorship. Okay. okay. Yeah, through mentorship. So you look around the business and you see someone that you are, mm -hmm. you, you think you can open up to, mm. mostly someone who's senior. Mm. And you present your case to them and you see, it's it's basically just taking, choosing someone who's neutral. Yeah. In a neutral yeah. space and say, this is me, this is what I've done. What yeah. do you think? Do you think I should mm -hmm. be here? How do you think I can get here? Mm. And then they start pointing, t telling you things that maybe you think you are doing well, but you're not. 
like mm -hmm. things like visibility now for for mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. you know as as uh, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and and then once you've you've spoken to this person uh, and you're ready to go now and face your supervisor, then you can go and and then it is it's always very crucial to try and not be aggressive when it comes to these kind of discussions because a lot yeah. of people. I've seen people getting really vexed when it comes to these things. Okay. You know, you go there like, no, no, why is so and so doing this? Why, yeah. why, why? Yeah. What has he done? What you know? Don't think about them. Don't drop. Don't don't name drop. Just yeah. be yeah. you. Talk yeah. about you. Highlight yeah. whatever you think you've done best. Yeah. And ask if for feedback. Ask if mm. there anything that I'm missing in this space mm. that mm. I can do better so mm. that I can be able to be progressed. Okay, okay. Yeah. And what if they tell you that, you know, you're doing everything okay, you're on the right track, you just need to give it time, and, you know, this kind of talk, how do you, or does it still boil back to mentorship and going to speak back to, to your mentors? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, the, the, these are really, really tough conversations, to be yeah. honest, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting that you're mentioning them because it's it happens, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's very, very much there in, uh, in, 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 in industry, because in industry, yeah. unlike academia, there is, there is hierarchy, you know, there is oh, opportunities yeah. to grow. If you're a postdoc, you're just a postdoc. In industry, yeah. if you're a junior scientist, you, is, uh, you can be a junior scientist, a research scientist, senior scientist, a uh, specialist, principal scientist, a director. So there is, you can see the ladder there. Yeah. So, and you always want to progress. Yeah. Uh, but but again, you know, it, it, it's not just you who wants to progress. There's so many of you who want to progress. Um, yeah. And at times, you know, they always keep telling you all these things. So yeah. uh, for me, I always go back to my my uh, the, the 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 person, my mentor, and say yeah. this is what I've been told, and this is what I've I actually think I'm executing very well. Yeah. So in a way, I always ask. You know, I always try first of all and put everything in in word. Not it's not just so that's just it's not just word of mouth. Mm, you mm. Know, so I after the meeting, I go back and write an email and say, as discussed, yeah. this is blah blah blah. You've advised yeah. me to do this yeah. so that at least you have a track record of all the things yeah. that you've yeah. been yeah. you think you're doing well and you actually um, and you're not progressing because of that. So at least you have evidence yeah. so that in future, because at times it's more of a managerial thing mm. than. Than, than the business, the actual business. Mm -hmm. So in future, when your your manager changes, you can even ask yeah. for a new, a, a different manager if 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 you have the guts to do so. You know, if yeah. you think that you're not yeah. progressing because of that, yeah. you can find a polite way of asking if you can work in a certain group, mm. or alternatively, you can find a rotation, a job rotation to work in a different area. And that's another thing that we actually benefit more in an industrial setup compared to an uh, to academia whereby like in Ovanodisk now I can ask for um, rotation to go and work in a computational biology group for instance mm. and then you go in there for six months mm. work and then you can try and and find if that is your calling yeah and you're yeah. comfortable working there yeah. and then that's your escape route you switch yeah okay. so you, you <laughs> there's good. different ways of navigating mm. this without making it yeah. uh, a bit of a political yeah. thing.